people, all of your carnal, all of your fleshly, all of your worldly ambitions and desires and lusts, all washed away as you came through the door of Christ. Amen? Amen. Is that true? Yes. Is anybody excited about that? Yes. Come on. Yes. You ever walk into one of those stores? You walk into the store and they got this like heater. They got them out like this so cool. They got this heater. You walk in the door and there's this like wall of heat that you just kind of walk through with blowing down on you. Anybody run through those? Mm -hmm. That's what it's like. We come through that door of Jesus and that and by the blood we're cleansed, we're washed. We're washed and sanctified that we might enter in to the holiest of all and have peace with God and friendship with God and fellowship with God and, and enjoy the presence of our Father and enjoy being our Father's son or daughter. We find our delight in the presence of God. Amen? Amen. And so Romans says we're, we're justified by faith. And if you're like me, i got to figure this out. i got to do this on my own. i got to figure this out. And so the idea of faith, no, 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 I've got to figure this out. There's got to be a way that God would accept me because of me. Surely I've I got to be able to do something good. i got to be able to pay God back somehow so that I can accept this gift. We can't. We just can't. It'll never happen. It's only by receiving. And, and by receiving that we say, you know when you give up the fight, you feel like, okay, I quit. You give up the fight. That's the place you come into when you receive the faith of God. You give up that fight of trying to establish self-righteousness or trying to figure out your own way. Because the simplicity of the cross and, and the confusion of the cross toward the unbelievers was that, is it that simple? Is it that simple that I just have to receive Jesus? Of course, we follow after him, and, and we, we seek after him, and we love him, and we serve him. But, but it, that door is the door of faith. It is the door of Christ. And we receive it by faith, not by our works of righteousness that we've done. And a good, uh, we can see a good picture of it in the scriptures where we saw the two men praying, and the fair, one was a Pharisee, one was a publican, and the Pharisee dressed in his religious garb, looking all religious in his attire and everything. And he prayed and said, God, thank you that I'm not like that guy over there. I paid, and he, then he ran down his list of credentials. I paid tithes of all that I have. I fast twice a week. This, this, and this, and this, and this. And he went down, sort of establishing, Lord, you received me because look how good I am. Look at what I do. It's no wonder that you received me, Lord. Right? That, that's kind of their mindset. It, it's, a, it's established on self-righteousness. While the other guy over here, and I call this religion, but this guy over here was broken. He was so humble and he was so sorry about his sin. And he was so broken, he smote his breast in agony. God, why did I fail you? God, I did it again. Did you ever feel that way? God, I told you I was not going to do it and I did it again. God, forgive me. And, and he couldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, which one of those guys went home justified? It was the guy that was broken. Because he came to the end of his fight and he said, I receive your grace. I just, I receive your mercy, Lord. I can't, I can't make the list. I'm not that good. And you receive by faith and and, you know, there's many promises we make to God. And, God, I'm not going to do that again. And, and this and this and this. And we fail, we fall short. We fail. But when we come, we, we realize that our, our weakness, oh, like she was talking about the marriage, right? Mm -hmm. How the, the strength of one complements the weakness of the other. And this is how we come to Christ. And, and what is the, the supper that we're called to? It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because as the bride, as the church as the bride, we come and, and we meet with the bridegroom and he strengthens us. And, uh, strengthens us. So when we're weak, he's strong. Amen? Yeah. When we're poor, he's rich. And when we are unrighteous, he's righteous. And he's everything that we need and everything that we, as we come through that door, 
we're justified and we have peace with God. And as we went down through the whole thing about, you know, tribulations that we go through, the tribulations, those are like going to the gym. They're hard. I don't want to go to the gym. Right? I want to be strong in the things of God, but, I don't, you know, I want to be good in the flesh and be strong and be healthy and cardio and all these things and tone up and get rid of some flab and, you know, I want the good things on me and I want to get rid of the things, but i got to go to the gym. Yeah, you do. Half of it is getting there, right? That's what they say. Half of it is getting there. And then you just go in. And, and the same thing like getting into the Word or getting on your knees in prayer or getting to church. And that's half the battle, I believe, because the devil wants to keep you. But tribulation is like doing that workout. It's resistance. Tribulation is resistance against your flesh and against the comfort zone that you're in or against your... Um, um, Convenience, and that's those are what tribulations are are sort of like. But as we exercise those tribulations, we get stronger, don't we? I've done this. I've been down this road before, and you develop a strength, and you develop a, a you know a build of resistance against temptation, and against um, uh, discouraging thoughts, and against people's opinions, right? You, and, and you sort of. Uh, mold yourself and, and allow the Spirit of God to mold you into the man or woman of God that God desires you to be. And we talk, you know, through that, that after all that um, experience, we have hope. And hope will not let us down. Hope will not make us ashamed at the end of the day. And, you know, I was praying this morning for people that in, in these other countries where they're suffering, and they're even on the run, and, and they're being slaughtered. And, um, and murdered in cold blood uh, just for being Christians. And I thought, you know, my prayer was, God, protect them. God, deliver them from their enemies. But God is allowing them to be killed. And so should my prayer be, God, deliver them from their enemies? Or God, keep them in your grace? Because we know, according to the Scripture and Revelations, there were souls that were under the altar that were killed for the name of Jesus. Right. And those souls were crying out what? How long, Lord? How long until you avenge us? Yeah. And he said, it's not time yet because there's still more that are going to come that are going to be killed for the name of Jesus. Right? right? Yeah, right. And of course, I don't pray that that happens to any of them. But it is happening. But we pray, and I, as even as I wish they would... Or pray for us or we would pray for each other God that no matter what we go through that our faith would not fail that God's mercy would be on us that our faith would not fail that we would never deny him but even to the very death we would hold on and I'll tell you these are not easy things to talk about these are not popular things to talk about these are things that we probably never thought we would talk about in the American church but these are things that are coming very close to our backyard. Amen? Amen. And, 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 and to some degree, I believe God's allowing it. Right? Yeah. I believe God's allowing it. But God will be with us in those tribulations. God will be with us and always fill our heart with hope. It doesn't mean you won't have a broken bone. It doesn't mean you always feel good. It's, it means that God will be faithful. God, your faithfulness reaches to the heavens. Amen. God will be faithful to us Amen. in all these things. Amen? Amen? And so we can encourage others in the same way because of that experience and because of that hope that's in us, which is Christ. Amen. And again, we talked about the blood of Jesus and how that um, um, through him we received atonement, the cleansing of our sin. And we're talking about the New Test, the new Covenant. So I want to take you over to Romans chapter 8. Hebrews, you mean? Hebrews, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 8. But you're right. <clears throat> There's no condemnation in Christ for those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Uh, when we come to that door, that, that blood washes us. I was guilty outside there, but when I came inside, I'm not guilty. Because the blood washed me. Amen? Amen. Oh, I'll tell you, the devil still wants to stand there say, your garments are dirty, your garments are dirty. You still are that same man. You still are that same woman. No, when I came here, what you don't understand, devil, 
to that armor. When I came through the door, I was washed in the blood. Amen? And the same protection that God gave to Israel in the midst of Egypt with the blood on the doorposts, that same protection, that meant life, that same protection, God will keep us and wash us. Amen? Hebrews chapter 8, we're talking about the new covenant, and I want us to understand, it's really important for us to understand, if we don't understand the, the new the, uh, the priesthood or the, the covenant, we're not going to understand how important the blood of Jesus is. Uh, we'll understand that he gave his life for us and that his blood was spilled for us. But I, I want us to know much more than that, his position in heaven for us. So we're going to look at, at Hebrews chapter 8. Now the things which we have spoken, uh, this is the sum, meaning this is the point, as they're talking about the priesthood and the new covenant. We have a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So where is Jesus and what is he doing? Jesus right now is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Amen. Amen. That's where he is. You have to know where he is. You have to know what he's doing. You have to know what he's up to. Because he's up to it for you. Amen. And for me. Amen? Amen? So when the devil comes to beat you down someday, you just look up. And I see Jesus and he's there for me. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen? Amen. And he's the high priest. <clears throat> A minister of the sanctuary. Uh, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now what's making the comparison here, in the old covenant, in the old tabernacle was a tent made with hand, with, by men, right? That was called the tabernacle. While they were going through the wilderness, they would, Moses would, and the, the guys would put up a tent and the glory of God would be in that tent. Moses would go in there and fellowship with God and, 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 and get directions from the Lord. and It was just a glorious time and even the people outside knew it. But it's talking about that tabernacle now where God dwelt and it, and, it, and it was the presence of God. Now that tabernacle is gone and a new tabernacle has been made but not with hands. It's a tabernacle which is Christ. Amen? Amen. It says, uh, verse 2 again, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, and not men. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat to also to offer. So every high priest that came, he would bring the gifts of the people into the, the sanctuary and do the offering and do the... Um, uh, the sacrifices and what, whatever they brought, he would do the service of God so that God would be pleased. So that they would make a, he would be an atonement, a sort of atonement for the people that they would have peace with God. Right? So Christ is bringing himself now as the Lamb of God. He is that tabernacle made without hands. And what gift did he bring? It was the gift of himself. Right? The gift of himself. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest. Uh, seeing that there are, other, there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Who serve under the example and shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God uh, when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, he said, that you make all things according to the pattern which God showed but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry uh, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Now it's talking about Christ. Now he's the mediator of this new covenant, this new uh, uh, contract that God is making, not just with the Jews, but now with the Gentiles. Jesus is the mediator of this new covenant. It's not Mary, it's not Peter, it's not Paul, it's not anybody else. It's only through Jesus. You see, that's why in the last days, they're not going to have a problem with God. They're not going to have a problem with religion. They're not going to have a problem with doctrine. They're going to have a problem with Jesus as God. 
they're going to have a problem with Jesus being the only way, and they're going to have a problem with uh, saying that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? That he is the door. In fact, there's this, a scripture that says, um, oh, and, and there's, uh, they're going to have a problem with true doctrine. They're not going to have a problem with doctrine. They love false doctrine. But it's, it's true doctrine they're going to have a problem with. Now, there's a scripture that says, in the last days, some of you will be killed, and they'll think that they're doing God a service. Right? Do you ever read the scripture? Okay. So we have to look at what the picture is going to look like in that time. It's going to look like re religious. It's going to look like someone's really zealous for God. And even, even the Muslims think that what they're doing is unto God. Right? But they're going to be killing people thinking they're doing a service to God. So they believe in God. They believe in serving God. They believe in obeying God. All these things, but it's not going to be the real God or the right. true God. So don't be alarmed when, you know, if we see these things in our day, we see them certainly in other countries, but if we would see them on our own soil, don't be alarmed and don't think that God's against you. Just never deny Him. All the way down to the wire, don't deny Him. Because God will be with us. Amen? So Jesus is that mediator of this new, uh, a more excellent ministry of a better covenant that was built on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then, the, then should no place have been sought for a second covenant. And God knew that the first covenant was fault, had faults. God knew that. And, and he, he showed us that so that it would bring us to Christ. Because without the first covenant, we wouldn't see how weak we are. Because the law didn't make anybody perfect. It only showed you how weak you were, really. It, it, it just defines sin in our lives. But Jesus came to wash the sin from our lives. <clears throat> Verse 8. Finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days, says the Lord. I will put my law, my laws in their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And so this is what, see, the law was, the law was an instruction manual. How can I say this? We know that vinegar and, or, or water and oil don't mix. Right? Water and oil don't mix. There's, there's clearly separation there. And this is what the, the flesh of man and the spirit of God is like. They don't really mix. The carnal, the carnal mind with the spiritual mind, they don't really mix. But God has come and, and said, I understand you're carnal, but I'm going to make you spiritual. I'm going to put my Holy Spirit within you and speak to you my words of life so that you're not following rules and regulations. You're living from a changed life, a changed heart. So we don't have to go to the priest and offer up a sacrifice and say, I got such hatred, hatred for my brother. I brought two sheep today. Because the Spirit of God comes in us and changes and takes the hatred out so that we bring a, a love off. And so the motive and the intention and, and the whole aspect of the sacrifice is different. It's out of love and not out of regulations. Amen? And our obedience to God is just the fruit of our being in love with Him and our trusting Him and following His ways instead of rules and regulations that we can't obtain. So this is the better covenant with better promises. And He says, I'll put my law in their hearts and I will be to them a God, they should be my people. They shall not teach everyone his neighbor, saying, uh, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. And God puts this into every man. God puts that ability to know him. I think it's amazing to hear the testimonies in these Muslim countries where there's no preacher around, but Jesus is revealing himself to men. And they are being converted in the middle of the desert. 
because the Spirit of God is coming and writing upon their hearts the truth and righteousness and the ways of God properly. And he says, they shall know, uh, verse 12, I will be merciful unto their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. See, in the Old Testament, every time they came for the offering, it just reminded them of their sin. It reminded them of their weakness. It reminded them of how, how full of fault they were. But in the New Testament, God says, I'm not going to remember those anymore. When you come and you confess your sin, you repent. He, God doesn't remember it anymore. He's not going to bring it up to you. Amen? Because of his mercy and his grace toward us. He says, their sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. Now that doesn't mean you won't remember them. And that doesn't mean the devil won't be there to try to remind you of them. Trying to get you to fall back into your ways. Right? He'll be there. That's why we have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And remember that he doesn't look on them anymore. When the Father looks at me, he sees the blood. He doesn't see a house full of people that are, that are spotted and, 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 and guilty. Though they were. He saw the blood. And when we come before God, we bow our knees in prayer. Or we come and we lift our hands in worship to come into the holiest of all. What does the Father see? He sees the blood. Now, it's a given that we should always be repentant of our sin. I'm not talking about the person that's come in that's weighed down with sin and they don't really care. God won't acknowledge that. But as we come as his sons and come as his daughters and we know that we're walking and seeking him and we're covered with the blood, the Father sees the blood and he receives us. Amen? Verse 13, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first uh, the first old, now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So that beginning of the New Testament church was the transition time. See what Jesus says, now go and show yourself to the priest. See, he was that, that tabernacle, the tabernacle of God and, and the Holy Spirit was not poured out. So Jesus was telling them, just keep doing what you're supposed to do. The transition will be made where you won't be able to worship in the house. You won't be able to worship in the sanctuary because they'll be on the run. They'll be, they'll be persecuted, right? They'll be martyred. Many will be martyred. He said, but the kingdom of God will be inside of you. And so the old was decaying away. It was the old covenant, not the old, not the old letters, the 25-year-old the letters, right? The 3,000-year-old letters, we still got to read those. But it was the covenant that was passed away. Verse 1 of chapter 9 says this, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So the first covenant had, you know, the clothing and divine things that you had to go through, the washings and the ceremonial procedures and all these things. When somebody was unclean, they, you know, till sundown they had to go outside the camp and come in and wash and, you know, these kind of things. Even, you remember when, when uh, the Pharisees came and said, Lord, why don't your disciples wash their hands before they eat? That's what you're supposed to do, wash your hands before they eat, right? Because that was one of the ordinances that they had to wash their hands before they ate. And so they were saying, well, listen, if you're supposed to be promoting the ways of God, why aren't you telling your disciples to wash your hand, their hands before they eat? Well, because the, the old was waxing away and the new was coming, right? And so we don't serve God and, and Jesus didn't come to give us a whole new list of rules and regulations. He came to write in our hearts righteousness so that we would be led by the righteousness of God and do those things by nature because Christ is in us by nature do those things that are righteous so that doesn't mean we have to wash our, our hands anymore before we eat seems like a small thing right but for them it was huge how dare you say that we should wash our hands before we eat to them it was a big deal but Jesus said it's not what goes into a man that defiles him it's not the poor it's not this, it's not that that goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of a man that defiles him. 
And Jesus began to make that transition of, of focusing on the heart of man instead of the outward behavior or appearance of a man. Because if you change the heart, it changes the appearance. Doesn't it? Yeah. I think it's amazing that... It changes everything. This week, uh, if you watch the news, one of the White House's talking heads said this, something like this, I'm going to paraphrase it because it's not worth it. That in order to change ISIS, we, we can't shoot them and kill them. We, we'll, we can't murder them or defend ourselves with arms that way. What we need to do is give them jobs. Because if they had jobs, basically they would have something better to do and, and they would have maybe more self-esteem or, or something that they wouldn't do these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And I thought, these people are crazy. You know what can defeat ISIS? The reason that they're fighting is because this is the way they think. This is what's in their heart. And until Jesus comes into their heart and teaches them to love, and, their, and even their enemies to love their enemies, they're never going to change because their God right now is the devil, and their God tells them to murder. And that's what they do. But if we, would, if the church would pray, and I believe this with all my heart, if we would, you know, it kind of convicts me that I read these Testimonies and you read books about these men in the past and who's willing to go to the mission field. And these young kids would raise their hand and devote their life to the mission field. You just don't hear that call so much anymore like that. But who's willing to go? And Keith Green writes this song, Jesus Commands Us to Go. But we go the other way, he says. It's no wonder we're moving so slow when the church refuses to obey. Exactly. Just profound lyrics, and it's, it's, it's just so true. But until the heart, and, and we're, we are just as evil as ISIS, until Jesus comes in and changes our hearts and our minds. Amen? <clears throat> and he writes his laws on our heart, I want you to love. And so just naturally you love. I want you to care for, so naturally you care for. I want you to lift clean hands, so naturally we lift clean hands. And, and the, the law of God written in our hearts. So the first ordinance, the first covenant had ordinances and a worldly sanctuary. For there was the tabernacle made uh, first. And there inside the tabernacle was the candlestick, which represented the presence of God. The candlestick. Now, if we go into Revelations, remember when Jesus speaks to the churches and says, unless you repent, I'll remove the candlestick. It means they'll still have church, but Jesus won't be there with them. The candlestick of God won't be there with them. The presence of God. So they had those things, the candlestick. They had the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And, and after the second veil... Because there was the first entryway, and then there was another part that was separated by a veil. <clears throat> After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, it was like the holy place. I want to, I, I gotta grab my notes here once because I want to share a scripture. Uh, let's wait a minute. This is called the holy place, the, the second veil, um, the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, was laid about with gold, it had certain items in it, the, 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 the angels that overshadowed the, the mercy seat, and these were all representation of something, they were all a figure of something, representing the power and the mercy and the authority and the presence and what's taking place in the heavenlies, heavenlies there was all these indicators that was revealing something but it wasn't the perfect covenant and God knew that so the old was done away with and the new was brought in Christ where he is the lamb of God and by his blood we're washed and the presence of God now abides inside of us do you remember the um, do you remember when Jesus was crucified and he, and he said it's finished and the land grew dark and then there was a veil that was torn in the temple mm -hmm. remember the veil that was torn yeah. God tore that veil. 
God tore that curtain because what it meant for mankind was that now that Jesus said it was finished and the Father received the offering as uh, that the high priest was giving, Christ, yeah. mm -hmm. now the way into the holiest of all was made for all men. That's why God tore the, that curtain. Because through Jesus now, we all come. In, <coughs> we all have access into the Holy of Holies. There's, that's why it says in the Hebrews... Um, uh, coming full assurance of faith, we have access into the presence of God. And another scripture that talks about the access. It's through Christ and through the blood of Jesus. Don't forget it. Because every time we drop to our knees, every time we stand in prayer, every time we lift our hands to worship, we come by the blood, we come through that doorway and that covenant that, that Christ made for us. Not of our own accord. You're going to come some days dirty. Right? Right? You're going to come some days a great failure. You can't let that separate you from God. You have to continue to come and say, Lord, keep writing on my heart. I'm getting it, Lord. Keep writing on my heart and teaching me your ways. And God will do that. Amen. So he goes on and says this. Um, now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone. So the priest would come into the first part, but the second part only the high priest could come. Right? It was a special sanctuary. It was called the holiest of all, only the high priest. That Jesus entered in for us, that we might come and have peace with God. I see some of you are yawning. I'll finish up here. <clears throat> but into the second, listen, into the second went the high priest alone. Okay. Once every year, but not without blood. He went with the blood into the holiest of all. Amen. Protection. Who which offered uh, which offered which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Does God know that you have heirs? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now we don't dwell on them. We don't. We don't. I don't. I don't think we have an attitude that well. I'll just live with my ears. I mean, we try to make things right before God. If there's something we're doing wrong, we try to make it right, right? Which we should. But we still have ears. If not today, we might tomorrow. We come how into the holiest of all. We come with the blood. Father, I come with the blood of Jesus. The devil comes to accuse, right? Blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. Amen. You're not worthy, blood of Jesus, There's blood of Jesus. Because I'm worthy by the blood which the high priest has offered for me in spilling his own blood. Amen? Are you getting this? Yeah. This has got to be so yeah. stamped in us. This has got to be so, you know, in our hearts, established in us. Let me finish up here. The Holy Ghost, verse 8, the Holy Ghost... Uh, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Meaning it didn't, it didn't wash away that you're guilty. It didn't wash away the guilty conscience. It just reminded you of it. But the blood of Jesus washes away the guilt. He says, in Christ there's no more what? There's no more condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And as you're seeking the Lord, God takes the guilt away. What you did, you did. You can't change that, but you're not going backwards. You're going forward. And you receive His grace and His mercy. Going on this, verse 10, which uh, could not make the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation. Right? When was the time of Reformation? Jesus Christ. That's when Jesus came. Jesus came. He reformed the ways of God, in a, in a sense. When, when in, in the Old Testament said, I for an eye, yep. he said, turn the other turn cheek. The other cheek. In the Old Testament, you know, when they went after their enemies and destroyed their enemies, he said, I want you to love your enemies. Amen? Amen. And that was the time of Reformation, that Jesus came to write, and, and by his Spirit in us, he writes upon our hearts the ways 
and the truth and the righteousness of God. He gives us understanding so that it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's not Ken, Ken or, or Kai or John. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory, Amen. each one of us. So we don't stand when we stand in the presence of God. And when we come and do our service unto God, we come through Jesus. He is the doorway. Amen. It's his blood that we come under. So again, when it's important for us to know this. When the enemy comes and tries to point his finger at you, or in, even in your own conscience, your own, your own heart, where you say, God, I'm not worthy, I failed you again. Whatever you come with, it says that God is greater than our hearts in 1 John. God knows our hearts. We come under the blood. Amen? Amen. And only this way can we come into the presence. This is the establishment of the new covenant that God has made with men. I think next week, uh, today is the 22nd? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next week we have communion. Unless this is a leap year, which I don't think it is. So February only has 28 days. We have communion next week. How important is it for you to understand this as you come to take communion? Makes me fired up. Makes me excited. Amen? It makes me... It's the blood! It's the blood! Thank you, Lord. And we, and we appreciate, from the depths of our being, we appreciate the sacrifice that he made for us, and we understand it, and, and it just develops such a gratitude in us. It should. A gratitude where we say, God, thank you. Father, thank you, thank you Lord. for the blood. Thank you, Lord, that you gave your body for me as this covenant. Listen, I, I expect that all of us that are, are able to take communion next week, that we will take communion next week. If there's some reason that you can't take communion next week, I want you to call me this week so that we can get together and get before God together and get yourself under the blood. Amen. where we should be. Amen? Amen. That we can partake of communion as one body, one heart, one voice before God and, and, and worship the Lord together. Amen? Amen. Praise God, I want to stand. I want to have a prayer uh, for Daniel and Alexandra and Logan. They're going to be going to Romania on Friday.